All right, hello students. Today we're going to be looking at Foner Chapter 1 still. The section titles are The Expansion of Europe and Contact, and if you have the 5th edition, it's on pages 13 through 20. So you should have already read that stuff by now so that I can talk about this more generally. We're going to spend more time evaluating Columbus's legacy uh, in class, so we'll skip this slide because there is much substance on it. Uh, let's look at the comparison between Columbus and Zheng He. I love that Foner mentions this because a lot of textbooks don't really look at this in, in terms of a global context. So Zheng He, if you haven't heard of him before, he was a Chinese admiral that lived during the Ming Dynasty in China, so during the 14th century. And just for comparison, first of all, the 14th century, that is the 1300s. So Zheng He's voyages were a full century earlier than Columbus's. Also, Zheng He's fleet was about 20 times the size of Columbus's. So you can see that here. This is Zheng He's uh, primary ship, and this is Columbus's, one of his caravels. Also, the length of the journey. Zheng He traveled a lot farther. Look, if you were to make this a straight line, consider how far this is, right? Zheng He reached at least the east coast of Africa, and there are some historians that stipulate or speculate rather that he actually went farther than that whereas Columbus's voyages were more or less a straight line transatlantic voyage um, and he did not stop at as many locations um, oh a couple other things um, in terms of intentionality uh, first off Zheng He was not aiming for the same thing that Columbus was he was not looking for riches he was not looking for places to trade and then once he found places he wasn't looking to colonize the land or kidnap the residents of that land or anything like that instead Zheng He's purpose was to showcase items from the Ming Dynasty to show off to the rest of the world. One of the reasons why this ship was so big was because they were growing plants on it they had all kinds of livestock it was insane how much stuff was on these ships so yeah, the purpose was completely different. Also, uh, Columbus actually miscalculated the circumference of the earth by about 25%. Um, and he believed that he was in India until the day he died. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the reasons you might, you might ask yourselves, well, why don't I know more about Zheng He? I mean, first off, if you're studying American history, it just may be left out of the textbook. Secondly, actually, Zheng He's voyages marked the end of this age of exploration for China. The Ming emperor was actually a little bit jealous and paranoid about the kind of notoriety that Zheng He gained from these voyages, and uh, he shut them down after that. So, you know, we're closing a book on that period of history for China, so maybe that's why it's somewhat erased from some of the textbooks. Not erased per se, but since it happened earlier, it's not normally grouped with the Age of Exploration, which took place about a century after. Speaking of the Age of Exploration, let's look at a few other explorers here. We're not going to talk about every single one on the map because I want to keep these videos short. Um, so let's highlight a couple of other guys um, and, and note how important their accomplishments were. So first, let's turn to the Portuguese. Vasco da Gama, in 1497, he rounded the Cape of Good Hope and he actually reached dun, 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 India, the place that Columbus was trying to get to. Um, so that's a very, very important accomplishment. And that also um, explains why the Portuguese prospects, the Portuguese goals were mainly centered around the west coast of Africa and India. Eventually, the Portuguese discovered Brazil. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, but this is really, really important. Um, and it also, in a way, if you're looking at all these different e explorer paths and you're seeing they're colored, but I don't think there's a key on here. This is also an interesting period of global competition. That These explorers, even though they were individuals, they were sailing on behalf of a country. And so um, these accomplishments can be compared in a nationalistic way as well. Another explorer going back to Spain that we should highlight is Magellan. Now, Magellan's fleet, not Magellan himself, but his fleet successfully circumnavigated the globe in 1521, uh, the first fleet to ever successfully do so. I said Magellan didn't make it because he actually died outside of the Philippines uh, before they returned. But nonetheless, this is a really significant accomplishment for Spain. Um, but it was accomplished after Columbus. So one could argue one of the reasons why Columbus gets so much attention is partially because you see that his exploration was the earliest out of all these others. But we're going to talk more about how historiography changes the view of Columbus in class. Ooh, one other guy to talk about, he's not even on this map, is uh, Vasco Nunez de Balboa. Uh, again, he was Spanish, and he crossed, I, I moved the cursor over here, because he crossed the Isthmus of Panama in 1513, 
which made him the first European to reach the Pacific from the Western Hemisphere. So you can see that Columbus isn't the only person playing this exploration game. If anything, we could argue that Columbus was important, at least in our textbooks, uh, because he was sort of a catalyst for this greater European age of exploration, but it's even more complicated than that. The book doesn't talk about this, but I want to just briefly talk about a treaty uh, called the Treaty of Tordesillas, all right, which explains, again, some national competition in terms of the age of exploration and colonization. So this treaty was uh, ratified in 1494 between Spain and Portugal, and what it did was it set a line of demarcation between the Spanish and Portuguese areas of settlement. So the Spanish were essentially they granted themselves. It's not like the indigenous people agreed to this treaty, of course, but the Spanish gave themselves the right to settle any land west of this line of demarcation, and the Portuguese gave themselves rights to settle and exploit the resources uh, to the east of this line. Now, you might ask, why would the Portuguese agree to this? You know, they're not giving themselves much of the Americas. Part of the reason why is because of the year. This was only two years after Columbus's first voyage, so there wasn't much of an awareness of what was west of this line. Secondly, the Portuguese were primarily interested in the west coast of Africa and India. They did not even discover Brazil until the year 1500, which explains why Brazil became a Portuguese colony. Let's look at broader motivations for exploration. We're going to use the Spanish as the example here, although this could be used as, uh, as a motive for any European uh, country who is sending out exploratory missions at this point. Uh, the three G's are a really easy way to remember these motives. Okay, so again, using the Spanish as an example. So gold. All right, so in Columbus's first encounter with the Taino people of the island of Hispaniola, which is now where the Dominican Republic and Haiti are, um, when he was first there, he saw that some of the Taino people wore gold jewelry, and Columbus became convinced that there was more gold on this island. And in his first letter back to the king and queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, he told them that there were vast quantities of gold on the island of Hispaniola. Turned out that there actually wasn't much gold there, but there was a lot of fertile land, and there were people that were, in Columbus's opinion, exploitable. Uh, he frequently wrote back to the king and queen about how uh, the, the people that inhabited these islands could be used as slaves. Um, or he may not have used the word slave, but he talked about them as a source of very cheap labor. Um, Columbus explored the Caribbean for nearly five months, particularly the islands of Juana, which is now Cuba, and Hispaniola, I already said, which is now the Dominican Republic and Haiti, before he returned to Spain. And he ended up leaving 39 people behind to build a settlement called La Navidad in present-day Haiti. Um, he also kidnapped several indigenous people after that first voyage, between 10 and 25 of them to take back to Spain, and only eight of them actually survived this voyage. He also brought back small amounts of gold, as well as native birds and plants, to show the richness of the continent that he believed was India. And he did this to convince the Spanish throne to finance future voyages, and they did. Columbus went on four voyages. But in terms of the legacy of this gold motivation... There was much greater amounts of gold in other parts of the Americas, particularly where the Aztecs were, and even more so where the Incas were. Um, so this motive for gold that uh, Columbus in many ways sort of furthers uh, was one of the reasons why Hernan Cortes ended up conquering the Aztecs in, uh, oh geez, what year was that? Sorry. Uh, it was, uh, yes, 1519 is when Cortes conquered the Aztecs, and then 1531 to 1532 was when Pizarro conquered the In Incas, and in the process of conquering the Incas, he not only killed their leader, but he also, uh, in a ransom effort, ended up uh, acquiring vast quantities of their gold reserves. Uh, glory. Um, this is much more self-explanatory. The glory motive for uh, exploration was both personal, the idea that, you know, you as an individual, Columbus, Pizarro, Magellan, etc., would uh, gain a legacy. They would live forever in history. But more broadly, there was also a quest for nationalistic glory, which I've already talked about a little bit, so I don't want to belabor the point. Um, God, okay, the Spanish Reconquista, which is mentioned in your textbook, the Reconquista was when 
um, the Spanish expelled all the Jews and the Muslim Moors from the Iberian Peninsula. And the Reconquista, it was a gradual process, but it was complete in the year 1492. What a coincidence. So uh, Columbus was not only in search of a path to India, but he was also in search of more peoples to spread the Catholic faith. And you probably are familiar with this living in Southern California, but there were a number of Spanish missions that were sent all over uh, the New Spain area of the Americas after Columbus, uh, once, uh, once the greater continents of North and South America are discovered. Finishing up with the Columbian exchange, we're going to be really broad here because we're going to dig deeper into it in class. So the Columbian Exchange, it's an interesting example of early globalization, making these connections across continents. Um, it was an exchange of goods and people between the old and new worlds, and some of the most important items exchanged were corn, potatoes, and tobacco from the new world. Now, we'll talk a lot more about tobacco later when we talk about English colonization, so hold that thought. Um, but what's really interesting is that... Uh, you know, the goods that go in the opposite direction are beneficial, but in many cases, actually harmful. So cattle were brought to the New World, uh, cows, horses, um, which could be seen as a huge benefit. However, so did diseases and the most prominent and deadly disease that traveled from the old world, quote unquote, to the New World was smallpox. OK, the people who lived in North and South America were not immune to smallpox. Europeans and Africans were. And so about over the course of 100, 200 years or so, I used to know the date range off the top of my head, about 90, 90% of the indigenous population of the Americas died off, at least the ones that came in contact with Europeans. And they died off partially because of violent conquest, but even more so because they succumbed to this disease. Okay, so we're going to talk much more about that, sort of the the pros and cons to this global exchange. We'll also evaluate Columbus's legacy, um, and we'll do that by analyzing some primary documents and possibly watching a short video on the Columbian exchange. So that's it for now. I hope this was helpful for understanding the reading. I'll see you soon.